I'm Dean Kuriakis, I'm president of the Christ Hospital Heart and Vascular Institute, professor of clinical medicine at The Ohio State University. I'm also deputy editor of Jay Sky. I'm here today with Dr. Bruno Scheller of the University of Saarland, Hamburg, Saar, Germany, who's been a pioneer in the field of balloon-mediated drug delivery. Um, He's also senior author on a publication in J. Sky entitled Coronary Drug Coated Balloons for De Novo and Instant Restenosis Indications. Also with us today are Antonio Colombo, Director of the Cath Lab and Interventional Cardiology at Radcliffe Cardiology, Maidenhead, UK, and Alok Finn, who's a Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and medical director as well as chief scientific officer for the CB Path Institute. The topic is very timely, and I think it reflects the incredible gap that exists in the interventional portfolio between the United States and the rest of the world. So I'm going to start by asking Dr. Scheller uh, to describe the objectives, goals, and other aspects of your paper. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, nice introduction. Um, I was allowed to, to be part of an author group uh, to give an, a comprehensive review on truck coated balloons in G-Sky. Uh, first author is Daniele Giacoppo from Italy. Uh, and uh, also on the team uh, is Jorge Sosedo from the United States. So this is a very international uh, collaboration we had for this paper. Um, with uh, the indications of, for drug coated balloons in the coronary field, we have uh, two main directions. Number one is, of course, instant restenosis, which is a well accepted indication outside the United States for, for drug coated balloons. We have in Europe a class 1A recommendation for the use of uh, DCP for the treatment of instant restenosis. And this is an overview of the major. Uh, uh, randomized trials comparing drug coated balloons with drug diluting stents for the uh, treatment of instant restenosis. And as you can see, there is no real, uh, very large trial within, but uh, taking all these trials together, I think we have meanwhile uh, very good clinical evidence for the use of this device compared to DS. And um, Daniela's group um, uh, did a great job conducting the Daedalus uh, meta-analysis. This is a patient level meta-analysis comparing the uh, uh, use of drug loading stand and drug coated balloons, pac uh, only paclitaxel coated balloons for the treatment of uh, instant restenosis. And in, in the second paper from this uh, Daedalus trial, they looked at different factors um, influencing um, the outcome after this treatment. And uh, if we focus on the uh, treatment of uh, tracheolytic stent uh, restenosis, there is a clear sign that um, the, the use of a second stent within the first three years has a somewhat better efficacy in terms of reduction of target lesion reintervention. So you have with a, a DCB uh, on average uh, um, about 30% higher probability for repeated interventions than when, when using the second, second stent. But on the other hand, if you look at, at safety endpoints like death or myocardial infarctions, there's a clear sign that uh, uh, with the use of DCB and not in implanting a second layer of metal, there may be a lower risk for these um, art clinical endpoints. So um, this means you have to, they, 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 none of the concept is perfect. They have their, their pros and, and, and cons. Um, and uh, one of the lessons we have to learn is that uh, for the use of DCB, we have to do uh, the best mechanical uh, preparation of the lesion we can do. Um, and then this was also uh, nicely shown by Antonio's group years ago, that the better you do the lesion preparation and treatment of instant was the better the outcome is uh, with tracoated balloons. Um, and very new hot data is the 10 years follow up of the ESA Desire 3 trial. This was a three armed uh, a trial for the treatment of drug eluting stent restenosis comparing POBA, uh, a paclitaxel coated balloon, and the Texas stent, uh, paclitaxel eluting stent. And um, this is the, the uh, maze overall. And as you can see, um, Oba had the highest event rate, and this was driven by repeated interventions, of course, compared to the truck loading stand and, and truck loaded balloon approach. 
uh, not shown in this in this figure is the fact that we see a difference between tracoated balloons and tracoluting stand in terms of mortality at longer term follow up. And this is one of the interesting findings from this trial. However, of course, it is limited that the the truck routing stand use was the taxi stand and not the current generation lime routing stand. But very interesting to see that over this long uh, time follow up, uh, we see clear differences between the, the different devices. The next interesting, or in my opinion, more interesting uh, indication is the treatment of uh, de novo lesions. Um, this is uh, uh, the summary of the trials, the randomized trials investigating drug coated balloons in the treatment of uh, small vessel disease. Um, um, the uh, first was the Picoleco trial, which was negative in, in the early days of DCB treatment. Then the first successful use of uh, DCB for small vessel disease was reported again by Antonio, uh, the Bello trial. Um, and uh, we were in we were allowed to publish the basket small two trial as a far largest randomized trial with uh, 758 randomized patients comparing a DCB with uh, a tracker looting stents in the treatment of small vessel disease. And this is the uh, primary endpoint maze um, uh, for the basket small uh, two trial over uh, three years. And as you can see, the event rate is almost identical between a DCB treatment and uh, use of uh, current generation tracheolytic stents. Um, this is good news that it's non-inferior. The bad news is that we hope to have a separation of the curves after the first year in, in favor of the tracheolytic balloon concept. This was not the case, but maybe we can discuss later the reasons for, uh, for this. Very important to know if you start uh, working with DCB, especially for the novo disease, is that you uh, have to focus uh, on lesion preparation. Um, the At the end of your procedure, if you have done your lesion preparation, um, it is not that that uh, big deal if you use a stand or a DCB for local track delivery, but the, the most important focus, most important step is the lesion preparation. And as this, I think this is a, a new field uh, where there is already lots of experience, but where we may need additional data, additional concepts in the, in the future. Um, is it safe to use TCB uh, in coronary artery disease and especially paclitaxel coated balloons? Yes, it is. This is a, a meta-analysis uh, we conducted together with uh, all the PIs of the, of the uh, large randomized trials comparing TCB with alternative treatments. And the first good news is that we have a lower rate of myocardial infarction within the first year. This means this argument that stents keep the artery open and balloon angioplasty has a risk of acute closure um, is not seen in, in, the, in the clinical data we have. And if we look at longer term follow up, we see signals for a reduced mortality and for sure not an increased mortality as it was reported in the uh, initial uh, meta-analysis from the peripheral arteries. So, and the last point is what's also a uh, very important topic at the moment is um, what is better, pactataxel or serolimus uh, for balloons? You know that the majority of the clinical data is available for pactataxel coated balloons. And uh, the argument uh, many people have against pactataxel is uh, cytotoxicity. Um, this is true, but it's a little bit a simplification in my opinion, because we see this increase in cytotoxicity um, with pactitaxel uh, with uh, tissue levels, tissue concentrations starting with 100 nanogram per milligram. Um, and the question is, do we reach those uh, tissue levels in, in um, the clinical application? For the uh, coating of stents, it may be the case uh, immediately nearby the stent struts. For DCB, we typically uh, reach a dose uh, concentration of 100 nanogram per milligram, uh, maybe within the first hours, maybe not, but uh, for sure not after the first 24 hours of use. So for DCB, this uh, cytotoxic aspects of pactitaxel 
may play not a real role and and this will be interesting to see if we compare in the future those uh, types two types of of dcb with each other um, and the major limitation in my opinion of the uh, uh, serolimus coated balloons at the moment is the very limited uh, uh, clinical evidence we have and, and that's one of the things we have to increase in the future namely large randomized uh, well done clinical trials to to see if serol imus will be an improvement of dcb tele technology or if pactitaxel will remain the main uh, technology so that that's what, what i summarize uh, try to summarize from our uh, paper well that's uh, really an excellent summary of the use of drug coated balloons so largely uh, for coronary application outside the United States. So there's a lot of uh, United States interventionists uh, that have a, got a lot to learn from that. Any comments uh, from Antonio or uh, from Alok? Do you guys have anything to add to this? Questions? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, as far as Europe or outside the United States is, con is concerned, uh, the use of DCB drug coated balloon for instant wrist stenosis and small vessels is very accepted indication and is part of the clinical practice. So I believe there are a number of randomized studies shown the observational registry that support this application. My question is, should we use drug coated balloon in large vessels? in vessel three millimeter or bigger, uh, and why not uh, to use a stent, or when uh, to use a DCB instead of a stent? Uh, so this is the, the open question. Uh, we can discuss, I have my own opinion, but uh, I like to throw this uh, point of discussion regarding large vessels uh, versus stents. You know, I, I think that's a great point. Your point is, if you leave nothing behind, that's that's the promise that was for bioresorbable scaffolds, and it is the reality for drug-coated balloons. Is there any lesion that you shouldn't treat with a drug-coated balloon after optimizing lesion preparation, which I think you've shown very nicely, Antonio, use of uh, physiology, imaging, uh, IFR, FFR imaging, uh, and optimizing MLA, MLD before you treat with a medication, you return pulsatility, phase of motion, positive adaptive remodeling, normal vessel physiology. Although, Bruno, we're going to come back to you in a second and find out why those curves didn't diverge after the first year, because with a re return in normal vessel physiology, one would expect to see better outcomes over time. But is there any lesion that shouldn't be treated with a balloon uh, at this point with drug? I would like to propose uh, like a step-by-step -step, uh, move motion. Let's first use the drug-coated balloon in large vessels to make the procedure easier, more simple. Example, bifurcation lesion. Why do we need uh, to do extensive double stenting? Why not start using uh, more and more drug coated balloon on the side branch? Uh, in long lesions, uh, why don't uh, we use a short stent uh, or maybe a no stent at all and use a drug coated balloon instead of putting a two 38 millimeter deaths? In total occlusions, uh, why don't we use the stent in the core of the total occlusion and treat the rest of the vessel with the DCB? So um, can we, instead of uh, pretending uh, to substitute, uh, which is something very provocative but needs to be, to be proven on long term, we can start by simplifying the procedure by using uh, this combination treatment when necessary. Hmm. You know, I was going to add that I, I think that um, 
there are lesions, I think, where we, we don't have really good efficacy for DCBs. And certainly, they've been around longer. In the United States, you say that we don't have a coronary DCB approval. I agree with that. We've had uh, approval for above the knee for DCB for uh, many years now, and we have a lot of experience with their efficacy in that region. And, you know, studies have shown that heavily calcified lesions don't do very well with drug-coated balloons. The drug absorption uptake efficacy is just simply not as good with heavily calcified lesions. So that's one example where I think, you know, we need to be careful about how we move the technology along. And in, in response to Bruno's comment, I think as U.S. interventionists, we're not very familiar with drug-coated balloons and how to prepare the lesion. It's a fundamentally different way. I'm sure Antonio and Bruno can tell us that fundamentally different than the way we prepare lesions for stents. And we're very used to using stents. So I think there's also a lot of learning on the part of U.S. interventionalists um, in order to optimize the technology. Uh, in my opinion, the decision has to come following pre uh, If uh, you have a good result, a no recoil or minimal recoil, some dissection, but uh, so-called simple, benign dissection, uh, even in a large vessel, I think uh, you should not uh, refrain from using drug-coated balloon. If the result is mediocre, that you already have the answer, implant a stent. So I think uh, uh, we, have, we think uh, even without pushing the envelope, you can uh, obtain a reasonable result in 60-70% of the lesions. Also, Dean, I would, I would um, add that, and I think Bruno can comment on this, um, is the real hope behind this technology, of course, is the vessel remodeling. That, you know, not caging the vessel with the stent allows us to have potential for vessel remodeling and, you know, vessel growth, positive remodeling over time, which may improve lumen areas as we suspected or hope absorb would do. So I think that's also where a lot of interest lies in whether or not we get separation of the curves um, long-term. Some studies have shown some separation with better results. One was just published in Jack Interventions recently, but some studies have not. So I think it would be interesting to get, you know, Bruno and um, Antonio's take on that as well. Bruno, is there a difference between uh, paclitaxel and sirolimus with respect to positive remodeling over time? Has there been any difference outside the U.S. when you've seen them in clinical trial? They've been tested against each other as well. You've done this. Yeah. So um, we, we have seen in the in the we have done two two ISR trials so far and and one uh, de novo trial co uh, comparing paclitaxel and and sirolimus uh, um, DCB. Um, in the ISR trial, there was no overall no difference uh, angiographically at, at six months be between both, both agents. Um, and this may be related that uh, you are focusing on, on neo-intima at the end of the day with, with your local truck delivery. In the de novo trial, uh, we have seen uh, a difference uh, in terms of uh, lumen enlargement. We have seen it with Paclitaxel in the range of about 60% of the lesions that are getting bigger after six months. And this is in line with, with all the other data that has, has been published. Uh, with Sorolimus, we uh, were at a rate of uh, 32%. And this compares very well to what has been reported in the BioRise uh, China trial with the, the Biolimus A9 DCB. Um, they also looked at small vessel de novo disease and compared POBA with, uh, with the, the DCB. And um, they found also about 30% lumen enlargement in the, uh, the biolimus group, which uh, is very similar to what we have seen with the, the Zerolimus uh, DCB in de novo. POBA was less frequent. They, were, they saw it only at about 10% of lesions. So the first experience is that um, Paclitaxel creates more lumen enlargement than Sorolimus. The, but the question is, it plays, does this play a, a role for, for clinical events? That, that's something we do. I, I would like to ask a question to Bruno and to Aloke as well. What, uh, what do you think about the issue of a microcrystal 
embolization of paclitaxel uh, creating a small uh, necrosis that has been uh, uh, reported in some animal models. I, I would say that, um, Antonio, you, I think it's a relevant question, and I think we do know, we've shown in multiple preclinical papers that you do get uh, paclitaxel emboli, small crystalline emboli, to small arterioles in downstream vessels when you treat uh, with these balloons. Uh, I think it's it can't be generalized. I think there are larger and smaller amounts of emboli depending on the balloon and the technology used and, and the transfer efficacy. But it is a concern, and we have seen microinfarctions with this type of technology, and certainly we do see uh, vascular emboli with or without infarction. So I think it's another aspect of the safety evaluation of these balloons that we should always consider. And when we use balloons, we should be aware that the more we use, the more we're going to have uh, more emboli and potential for these small down, uh, downstream uh, embolic debris that really the FDA is very, very in, uh, concerned about. Do you think that Ciolimus is less likely to cause this issue? I think it depends on the technology used, Antonio. I think that a lot of these, the ones you mentioned, the Concept Medical and the um, one from Med Alliance, don't really use crystalline form of Ciolimus. So they, and they're also, for the most part, the carriers are much smaller, in the micron range. Um, so... I think that most of the time these don't cause as much embolic shattering as with the Paclitaxel products, um, but I think it remains to be seen how efficacious they are, how good is the drug transfer, how sustained is it, and how good is the neoentomal suppression. Those are, like uh, Bruno mentioned, we have a lot less clinical data with the Seralimus coated balloons than we have with the Paclitaxel coated balloons. So that's one disadvantage right now for those products, but there are, as you know, there are IDE trials ongoing in the U.S. with both of those for ISR, and I think both companies have also gotten approval for de novo uh, cornering. What do you know, Bruno? What do you think, Bruno? Is, uh, I, I'd like to hear from you. Um, so, so with respect to the, the embolization, um, uh, we have to be aware that, um, number one, this this uh, um, risk, um, um are, are, so, uh, are, are not permanent uh, uh, crystals um, and uh, the, the number of, of these, uh, these uh, um, emboli is much less than, than you have uh, typically from what, what uh, atherosclerotic tissue is, is embolizing distally. So, so if you look at that, that it, it, you, can, you can see it, I, I agree. But um, the question is, is this clinical relevant? And what, what we did in our animal trials in, in the coronary arteries, we did a uh, uh, measurement of LV function at, before the procedure, immediately after the procedure at four weeks, for example. And we have never seen any sign of uh, a reduced myocardial in, uh, function in, in these areas. And I can tell you that from my personal experience, which is meanwhile uh, uh, 20 years with uh, DCB was in the coronary arteries, uh, thousands of patients treated. We have never seen um, complications related to, to distal emboli in, in the coronary arteries. Yeah. It's not just microvascular occlusion there. I, I look, you've actually shown the differential in con localized concentrations, more than eightfold, correct? I mean, for paclitaxel, how high will the concentrations be? These little emboli cause MVO, but they also cause a very high concentration of drug. Is that true? Now, there's definitely no question, Dean. We've shown that the concentration of drug can be extremely high in downstream arterial beds. And you also need to consider that we want to make sure these, these uh, drug emboli don't go to other unwanted tissues. Really, we surveil almost every organ in the animals when we do so-called GLP studies for FDA safety evaluations. We look at the lung. We look at the uh, other organs, spleen, et cetera, to see whether how good that how what the level drug levels are and whether there's any evidence of embolic uh, toxicity uh, in those organs. Do you guys do lesion prep? I'm going to ask uh, Bruno and Antonio. You know this idea of scoring balloons, cutting balloons, even buddy wire, something to facilitate the transfer drug into the into the subitum of the vessel. Um, how widespread is that outside the U.S.? 
Yeah, we 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 started changing our practice in our cast lab um, almost fifteen years ago. We changed from a primary scenting approach to a primary lesion preparation approach. This this means every lesion has to undergo a lesion preparation. Um, and it depends a little bit on the severity of the lesion. If you, for example, if you have a, a, typically in younger patients, if you have a, a lesion that is not not calcified that much, uh, I typically go go directly with a scoring balloon um, to prep this lesion, um, and and then can decide very, very good if, if the, this, this lesion tolerates angioplasty alone or if it requires stenting. And so you have a very fast decision uh, making um, if you can use the DCB at the end or, or if you have to stand it. In more complex lesions, uh, it's getting also more complex with lesion preparation. You need different tools. You need typic typically non-compliant balloons scoring, cutting, um, rotaplation plays a role, uh, nowadays, uh, also IVL in, in highly calcified lesions. So, um, it can take a relatively long time, uh, for leash preparation. You need uh, many devices, uh, frequently in complex disease. So it's, it's different. It's not the same every patient. Yeah. I, I do exactly the same as Bruno described, uh, we if there is a need to do autoblation, we do autoblation. If uh, after autoblation you go with a high pressure balloon and the result is uh, is good, uh, we don't uh, implant a routinely a stent. We do a DCB because the result is good. The problem, Dean, is that many young generation are not used to do angioplasty. They are not. They only can accept a stent result. And any result that is not a stent result is considered unacceptable. And uh, it's difficult to have a stent, exactly a stent-like result without a stent. I think one of the, the, the limitations we have uh, is that we have trials comparing different stents, different DCB, which each other on, on their efficacy, but we have very limited data, controlled data about the efficacy of lesion preparation and in which situation, which lesion preparation uh, gives the, the, the best result. So, so this has a lot to do at the moment with personal experience of the operators, uh, 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 what they select uh, for their lesion preparation. You know, the, the main reason why people do routine stenting is this uh, like a, a layman uh, statement, I want to sleep at night. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if, even if you have a, a small linear dissection with dual antiplatelet therapy, we did not have a single occlusion. Uh, of course, if the result is mediocre and poor, we are not encouraging to leave it as it is. But if the result is, uh, is uh, good or acceptable, uh, you don't have with dual antiplatelet therapy occlusion. Uh, I, I fully agree. That's that's also my uh, my experience. The the point is that with your lesion preparation, you set, you identify the lesions that are at risk. Number one and number two, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy um, uh, reduces the risk of acute and subacute vessel closure in a similar way as it uh, does. Uh, in, in the setting of stenting. You know, in addition to uh, small vessels, you guys put that out there, an instant restenosis bifurcation, you touched on that. Talk about ACS. Talk about the issue of these necrotic core lesions and ACS and then high bleeding risk patients. That's another population that could be addressed with uh, these devices. Is that a routine use uh, for you, Bruno, and you, Antonio? Yes, of course. Uh, HBR are the perfect patients for uh, for DCB. Um, here the question is, do they really need dual articulated therapy uh, for four weeks? Um, or is it possible to uh, uh, leave the patients with a single articulated therapy with uh, uh, tactobin, for, for example? This is one of the questions we have and, and where uh, trials are uh, have started now to, to address this, this uh, exactly. 
Antonio, are you using it for that? They are, uh, personally, we, in our hospital, we still do not routinely use DCB in acute coronary syndrome or in ST elevation, but there are studies in the literature uh, using uh, uh, DCB in, uh, in ST elevation MI with good result. So I think it makes a lot of sense uh, if, um, if the result is, uh, is very acceptable, uh, not to implant a stent, uh, you may have less uh, uh, distal embolization. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's very acceptable. Regarding the high bleeding risk patient, uh, we still give dual antiplatelet therapy for one week if the high risk uh, patient, patient. And then I know there is, there is no randomized studies, there is no large studies, but uh, I do not believe uh, you need uh, to continue to do APT for long term. Dean, I might add that I think that healing after balloon angioplasty or even drug-coated balloon angioplasty is probably much more rapid than after stents. I don't think it's been extensively studied. I think it does need to be studied. I think these are good candidates for um, uh, high bleeding risk. There's no question in terms of the what Bruno was mentioning. I don't think you need as much dual amplitude therapy. I don't think you need nearly as much as you need with stents. But other unanswered questions about thrombus burden and whether thrombus uptakes drug efficiently and can you get it into the arterial wall and not into the thrombus, those questions I think need to be really answered before you can say that DCB is is, is a good indication um, for ACS, or ACS is a good indication for DCB, sorry. I, I fully agree. The, the point is that you have DCB, you have only this one shot for your drug transfer, and if you have too much thrombus, it, it drug transfer will be very limited. Um, but again, we're coming back to the, the point that first you have to do a uh, lesion preparation, and in ACS patients, this means you have to get rid of most of the thrombus, which is, is in this area. Another, another issue is that, uh, you know, we know that DCB do not eliminate restenosis. Uh, you still may have restenosis uh, with the DCB, but uh, I believe, and we all know that uh, the pattern of restenosis with DCB is usually more benign much easier to be treated than some type of restenosis with DS. That's a great point. I think it's a very important point. You know, Bruno, you showed something in the uh, Daedalus meta-analysis that beyond a year, there's like a 30% differential increase hazard with restenting DES treatment of ISR with respect to death, MI, target lesion thrombosis. Others have suggested that stent overlap is not a benign issue. And in the U.S., by default, this is what we've expediently and glibly done. We pop one stent in on top of another stent, and we don't think of the ramifications of a double-layer metal. Um, do you think that hazard's real? There are other data points in the literature to suggest it may be. What's your opinion? The, the the issue with DCV for ISR is that um, you have to do more uh, mechanical work than you have to do with when when implanting a second stand, Be because if you if you do not expand the uh, the, the initial stand um, or address other other issues or mechanical issues, um, then your outcome in terms of TLR will be worse with DCV. So and and that's that's again the beauty of the second stand because you have, uh, in most cases, a better primary result than when using DCB in an ISR treatment. So mm -hmm. you know, this you you have to you have to really address the, the the lesion preparation in much more detail than it is the case when you use the second stand. You know, Bruno, the point of Dean was uh, uh, that uh, if you implant a stent uh, in a in a lesion and you get restenosis, uh, is, uh, the problem is more severe than if you do a DCB on a lesion and you get restenosis. Because uh, if you get restenosis with a DCB, maybe you implant, you do another DCB or implant a stent. A number of operators, when they get restenosis, especially if it's long, in a stent, they implant a second stent because they cannot get a good result and sometimes even a good operator cannot get a good result. So the, the impact of uh, risk when you do stenting 
is more heavy than impact of risk stenosis when you've done primary DCB. Yeah, I fully agree. And, and in addition, if you have two or more layers of stent, the efficacy of DCB is also limited. So, so it, 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 therefore, in, in my opinion, your first attempt for ISR should be using a DCB. If this fails, we do um, double dose DCB. And if you have another failure of this, then you can think about the, the, the second stand. Um, but if you start with the second stand, all your another attempts with DCB uh, have uh, uh, reduced likelihood of, of success. And, and another group of patients who may, who, who should be considered is diabetics. There'd be recently a publication, a sub-analysis of basket uh, too small, where in over 200 diabetics, uh, the event rate was really very low. So maybe not inserting metal in diabetics uh, may be advantageous. Yeah, good point. Very good point. May, 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 may I comment shortly on basket small tool, tool and why we were disappointed? Um, the problem is if you treat small vessels, uh, is that uh, small vessels create less clinical events than large vessels. And many of the patients in this trial underwent in addition treatment of large vessels during the, the uh, uh, study. And these were uh, lesions treated outside of the trial and in most cases treated with DES. And this is, um, this is uh, the most likely reason why we did most not see a difference because the, the trial was focused on the small vessels not creating events or less events. And the majority of the patients had uh, standard treatment with DES in the larger vessels. And therefore, and coming back into to, uh, or Antonia to, to your initial questions, what about larger vessels? I think in larger vessels, DCB may improve the clinical outcome in contrast to smaller vessels. Excellent point. Any, any other points that you guys want to make? I think this is going to be a tremendous publication to open the door for this technology in the United States, coronary application. Any um, final comments? Uh, my, my final comment that we need studies. What we said is a uh, work in progress, is a uh, working hypothesis, but uh, this is uh, something... Uh, that uh, the medical community will accept only if we can provide uh, large data. So we need to go home and work and provide data. I think we're looking forward to uh, an era in the United States where we have drug coated balloons. Uh, these guys are way ahead of us. And I think we, it's about time we, we get them and we get to use them and patients benefit from them. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I, I'm coming from large experience from implementing DCB in, in our daily work. Uh, and I can tell you it really works. Uh, you still need stents, but especially in complex disease and multi-vessel disease, you can uh, significantly reduce the number and length of the stents you implant. And um, as the, the, these new data from Korea show, this may also reduce the event rates overall for the patients uh, over a longer period of time. No, the problem is that the medical community is not uh, completely ready. Sometimes if I do DCB in a large vessel and the referring cardiology asks me why you didn't implant a stent, I have difficulties uh, uh, to convince. So sometimes uh, in a context of multivessel disease, I implant at least one stent just to tell that I implanted a stent. Uh, otherwise, he looks me in a funny way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank Sky and J Sky for giving us this opportunity. I want to thank each one of you, Hello, Bruno, Antonio, for sharing your immense experience and uh, expertise uh, on this topic, uh, which is quite timely here in the U.S. So, thank you. Thank you.